Thank you. Um, the way you said Rob is now here implies that there's been a discussion about Rob not being here. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a grand old tradition at Peg we have, which is an empty chair to signify uh, writers who've been imprisoned um, around the world. So I didn't want to be the, the person in the empty chair, and I'm really glad I'm here. Um, I was hot-footing over from Goldsmiths University, actually, was having a very intense debate about no platform, um, safe spaces, and uh, free speech on universities, um, which was good fun. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is a better uh, class of people, frankly. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it was just to impress. I put my tie on, we were looking great. Uh, and congratulations uh, to all the writers um, who, who uh, will be reading this evening, or, or who, who did read. Um, it's fantastic. Um, Louise, who asked me to speak, um, asked me to talk about the, uh, the role of the writer in the world, um, which speaks very closely to, and is a nice segue into, uh, the work of Penn. So I'll, I'll, I'll um, explain what we we'll do um, a little bit more in a moment. Um, but first, uh, before talking about Penn uh, and what writers can do, I, I just want to say a couple of things about creativity. Um, because today is a celebration of that. Um, one thing I often think about is the, the, the film director Steven Soderbergh's uh, Oscar acceptance speech in 2004 for Traffic. And he said, I want to pay tribute to anyone who spends part of their daily life creating. I don't care if it's a book, a film, a painting, or a piece of dance. Anyone who spends part of their day sharing their experience with us. The world would be unlivable without art. Uh, now, for a long time, that was my lodestone. Um, I pursued a creative career, as, as Eric said, working for 59 Productions. Uh, so we produced film and graphic design, uh, made a success of ourselves doing video design for, for theatre productions. Um, ever since I stopped working for them, they've become stratospherically successful. <laughs> um, in fact, they've got two shows on at the moment. Um, so they won the Tony Award for America in Paris, which is coming to West End just now. Um, and their adaption of City of Glass, which is a Paul Auster novella, um, is currently playing in, uh, in Manchester. It's coming to the Lyric Hammersmith uh, in April, so maybe I'll see you there. Um, while I was working on these creative projects, and, and ever since, in fact, working for, for Penn, um, I've held up the creative as the sort of the ide idealised person, uh, the sort of pinnacle of evolution. <laughs> um, and that's all well and good, you probably agree with me. But there is more to creativity than a simple desire to do it. Um, as you'll be aware if you've been studying creative writing, it requires a certain discipline and dedication. Uh, and there's plenty of people that will tell you uh, and explain to you that ideas and creativity flourish uh, through hard work and grit, um, keeping at it rather than some inspiration on the road to Damascus. Um, the writer Malcolm Gladwell is famous for popularising the idea uh, in his book The Outliers that you can become an expert in something uh, if you, if you spend 10,000 hours uh, doing it, and this prompted people to test it by spending 10,000 hours playing golf and complaining that they, they didn't win the Masters. Um, but if you think that we'll talk about it now, uh, he actually gets very annoyed that he's become famous for that idea. Uh, first of all, because it wasn't his. Uh, it was, uh, he was paraphrasing the work of, of other academics. Um, and second, he, he only cited the, the, the 10,000 hours figure uh, as a way of making the point uh, that to get very good at something, you need to invest lots of, lot of time. And moreover, you need an infrastructure of support that will allow you to spend 10,000 hours or whatever doing that thing. Um, and so for the creative life, that very often means that you need some kind of support network, whether that's a spouse, or parents, or friends, to indulge you. Uh, and that's something that we must not forget, and we should pay tribute to, uh, whenever we see someone uh, achieving uh, in their creative life. In addition, as well as the writer, the, the, the talent, um, there's the, the person that's sent you a piece of art. Uh, we've got to remember the, the people who support the production of that art as well. So in the case of writers, you have editors, copy editors, typesetters, designers, bookbinders, ebook coders, and of course, publishers. <laughs> I remember a, uh, 
the very first perfect bound book, a book with a spine, uh, that I read. And it was called Egg Box Brontosaurus by Michael, uh, Michael Deaton. Um, and Mark Shinwell, uh, was a boy in my class, who was learning to read alongside me at age six or seven. He got the book first, he was ahead of me. Uh, and, and I was very jealous of the book because it ended up looking like a real book. It had a, it had a spine on it, um, not, not staples. Um, as an aside, Mark Shinwell had no recollection of me at all when I tried to friend him on Facebook. <laughs> 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 Anyway, the egg box brontosaurus, the prince, he has this idea he's going to make a brontosaurus out of egg boxes. And uh, his obsession with having a label on the artwork that says uh, he made this all on his own. Um, and of course, over the adventures, he realises he needs help from his friends. Um, and eventually, the, the brontosaurus does get built with a sign that says, with help from his, his friends. Um, and so it's just a long way of saying that what I believe is that art created in collaboration is almost always better uh, than art created in, in solitude. Um, that's certainly been my experience. Um, everything I'm most proud of in my limited creative career, Ariel said, was a novella, not a novel. If someone says they've written a novella, it's either because they didn't have the attention span to write a short story, or they were too verbose. Right. No, the other way around. <laughs> they were too verbose to write a short story or no attention span to write a novel. Uh, in my case, it was the former. <laughs> like email and press of London has a short story. It's five times as long as it should be. Um, so, where was I? Yeah, it's, it, it was made better through the input of others, in particular my editor, Jared. Um, so, I hope you recognise the benefits of collaborative practice. And in this modern world, this sort of sharing economy, the new digital uh, technologies, it's much easier to have that kind of career, I think, and make that kind of art. Um, so, first of all, perhaps to be a writer in the world is to be a writer who collaborates in that way. So, English Pen was created as a response to solitude. Uh, in 1921, Amy Dawson Scott, the social networker of her day, um, realised that no, um, there was no club for writers um, who were a solitary bunch. And so she envisaged weekly literary dinners um, and co-opted John Gownsworth, who wrote the Foresight Saga, won the Nobel Prize for Literature, um, co opted him to be the, the inaugural president. And he agreed initially to stay for one dinner, but he liked it so much he stayed for 12 years. Um, and clubs, literary pen clubs, sprung up all over the world, um, guided by this common principle of sharing literature across frontiers. And the founders of Pen, which included Amy Dawson Scott, uh, uh, John Galsworth, and also the second president, who was H.G. Wells, um, they quickly realised that the free flow of literature, uh, the flow of literature to take place, you needed a healthy stance against censorship. And so, 96 years of campaigning for free speech began. Um, so, for Kersler and Federico Garcia Lorca, imprisoned by the fascist regime in Spain, uh, for the Jewish writers who were fleeing Nazi Germany, uh, for Sox Nixon and those trapped behind the Iron Curtain, for Wallace Silinka, Ken Sarawiwa, uh, Salman Rushdie. Um, and at every Free speech moment, you'll find Penn, the Penn Club, the Penn supporters uh, there standing up for the rights of writers to, to write for freedom of expression across frontiers. Um, and in the present day, we're proud to campaign for free speech, free speech um, backed by this, this love, founded on this love of literature. Um, so we fight against the legal barriers to, to writing. Um, we fight the censorship and the persecution of writers around the world. Um, and that's probably what we're, we're best known for, I think. But we also fight other barriers to literature too, such as language. Um, what if your favourite book is in a language you don't understand? It's certainly true of me. My favourite book is Labyrinth by Jorge Luis Pérez. I won't be able to read it if I haven't translated. Um, 
And so we run a translation program, promote the true translation in various uh, forms. Um, but with cold hard cash for uh, books to be translated into the English language, the best of world literature. Um, and literacy is obviously a huge barrier uh, too, because if you can't write and you can't read, uh, you're unlikely to be able to express yourself through literature. And finally, there's issues of power and of platforms, or things I've been uh, arguing about uh, earlier this evening. Um, the very important spirit of freedom of expression. Cultures and structures mean that some animals are more equal than others. Uh, and unless we take strides to redress those structural imbalances, um, then we're going to get a very narrow literary culture. So, for Penn's part, we run outreach programs, giving people without opportunities uh, a pub uh, um, to be published uh, a chance to do so. And of course, we campaign for and offer support to initiatives that um, foreground new different kinds of writing, um, seeking to make the literary ecosystem more diverse. Um, honestly, something else about the value of these programs is why I'm particularly proud of them. Um, it's a tangent into the realms of free speech, but I, 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 bear with me, I, I think it's important. I, I will be brief. Um, the commitment to freedom of expression does mean the commitment to defending the rights of people to say offensive and write offensive things. Um, and that's why it's defending over in Goldsmiths. Um, defending freedom of expression also means defending bad art and also unpleasant racist political speech as well. And that's very difficult for many people to do because they see the defence as, as an endorsement of the unpleasant racist, homophobic, sexist speech or whatever. Um, but it's not. And I, I'm sure you're actually aware of the, the Voltaire principle, uh, although it isn't Voltaire, <laughs> it's Voltaire being paraphrased by a woman called even Beatrice Hall. Uh, and she said of Voltaire's philosophy, um, uh, I hate what you say, but defend to the death. You're right to say it. Um, I think you might have, might have heard of that. And I certainly try to abide by that principle, um, but also I like to flip it on its head, or, or rather just say the clauses in the other direction. I defend your right to say something, but I hate what you say. <laughs> and first we, so first we affirm the right to freedom of expression, and we, once that's banked, um, we can set the parameters of the debate and we can engage in political condemnation or scathing artistic criticism uh, if, we, if we need to. And the philosopher Kina Malik goes even further. He says that there's a moral demand on anyone who uh, promotes freedom of speech. Uh, to, it's not simply enough to defend the right of people to say offensive things you must also use your freedom of speech to counter that speech you don't like. And to fail to do so is a sort of a moral of, uh, avoidance and an abrogation of responsibility. Now, uh, th so this is how I justify uh, uh, defending the rights of unpleasant people to write and speak and, and publish, because we use our own free speech to condemn them when necessary. And we use what resources are available to us to put other kinds of speech and expression into the world. So that's the pen translation program, that's the pen outreach program. Um, it's, a, it's a grand answer to what a writer can do in the world. Um, and I think for many, most pen members, I think being a member of our organization and being a writer that participates in the world uh, uh, is synonymous. <laughs> um, so they encourage freedom of expression, uh, encourage and support the idea of it frontiers, and then using their own writing um, and seeing it's a responsibility to do so, um, to defend those rights. Normally I get irritated with politicians who say that with rights come responsibilities, because actually no, human rights are rights that we have, however bad we are, and uh, they, they should be contingent on anything, um, with those strings attached. But having said that, uh, I do like the idea that people might consider the fact that they have a right to free speech uh, to, uh, to also entail a duty to use that free speech as well, to stand up for what they believe in. And my favourite kind of campaigning at Penn uh, is when our members use 
the creative act as a way to express solidarity with fellow writers uh, who might be in deep trouble in other parts of the world. And I'll just highlight three, three projects very quickly uh, because I'm very proud of them. And I think that the, the also the kind of projects that uh, you all can emulate in, in your own practice. Um, the first was a book called Catechism, Poems for Pussy Riot. And there is a brilliant pun there. Get at it. Um, in this case, uh, just following on the, from the imprisonment of four members of the punk band in Pussy Riot uh, in Russia, they, they say stage civil disobedience in a, in a cathedral in Moscow. 101 British poets gathered uh, under the pen banner to write some new poetry so in the style of Pussy Riot, the punk feminist uh, sensibility and aesthetic. Um, so those four women have been silenced, but these poets put their voices and ideas back into the world. Um, and we create a new culture, and we, we actually won the, the Saboteur Award for Best Anthology that year. Um, similar project we did the following year was called To Jailverse um, by a Cameroon writer called Ino May Messe, um, who inexplicably been able to publish a, a, a set of poems while in prison in Cameroon. Um, we got hold of it, it smuggled out in some way, um, and our members translated it into, into English. And in fact, when we sold it, the, the money went to you know, uh, legal fees. So again, this creative act in solidarity um, with an imprisoned, embattled writer, and using our own talents and freedom, to, freedom of expression to defend freedom of speech and some else. Um, and finally, the Pen and Modern Literature Festival is now in its second year uh, and is going to take place uh, at Richmond in uh, Shoreditch uh, on the 1st of April. Uh, and this is a, another brilliant example of literary campaigning. Um, we have three poets, uh, uh, three, 30 poets, um, <laughs> um, which uh, they've all been assigned a writer at risk, an international writer that we campaign for. And British poet um, is writing new work in response to the work and the plight and the life and times of that writer uh, at risk. And uh, last year the output was incredibly moving, so I, I would recommend that to you. Um, very high-minded and grand in my ideas of what it means to be a writer in the world. Um, but before I end, I, I actually want to give some practical suggestions um, for what you might do uh, now you have a creative writing qualification. Uh, if, if, if you have one, if you have graduated, or when you get your creative writing qualification, or simply when you consider yourself a writer, whatever that might be. Um, the first is, as I say, to collaborate um, and, and experiment with the form um, that the new digital technologies offer. Uh, two, translate if you can. Um, it doesn't just always need to be your words and your ideas that you put out into the world. And the act of translation is actually the supremely creative act because you're, you're rewriting the novel or the poem completely while keeping everything the same. Um, so try that if you can and uh, correspond with writers in other countries. Um, I know a lot of people uh, on creative writing courses also uh, go into publishing or work in publishing. If that's you, if that's your destiny, um, seek out those embattled, underrepresented voices and publish them, platform them. In this era of Brexit and this era of <laughs> uh, in, in, in this era of Brexit and Donald Trump, there is so much about politics of, of distance and division, and there's there's no way. Uh, I believe, to bring people together uh, and to create empathy than through literature. I'm, I am a chauvinist for the written word above all the other art forms. Um, literature, I think, uniquely um, has the, 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 the potential to, uh, to create empathy. Um, and when I talk about literature across, across frontiers, literature can break down frontiers, it can build bridges, and it can uh, uh, break down barriers. I'm going to finish um, by uh, reading a poem uh, by Ali Smith um, that appears in and was written for Catechism Poems for Pussy Riot. It's called Song. 
Every time you say no to something that's wrong, a crack the size of a hair and a single note of that song inserts itself in the stone, the meaning of strong. It might take a short time, it might take long. No, no, no. Listen, millions of us singing along. Thank you very much.